I have a new watch. It is terrible. What you're looking at here is what's commonly called an M4 wristband or fitness band or some such thing. It is the cheapest and nastiest smartwatch that small amounts of money can buy. This cost me two francs sixty, which is about 50% more than this knockoff blue pill cost me. What you get for this very small amount of money? Not much. Technically, this is a BLE attached smartwatch. It connects to a mobile phone that can push notifications and things to it. Practically, it's basically trash. They achieved the price point by cutting out all the extraneous features like battery life and reliability and a user interface and buttons and stuff like that. Let me take it off my wrist and I'll give you the tour. The silicone wristband came with it. The watch itself just pops out um, like that. This is the first watch face. This one is built in. You get a choice of two, one of which is programmable from the smartphone app. Pressing the button cycles you through the main menu. A long press select the item. So the steps function is a step counter that while I have been playing with this on my desk has gone up by about 200. So I am not convinced that is like accurate, maybe real. Heart rate is the heart rate sensor. It also somehow detects blood pressure and blood oxygen levels. It works by blinking the LED on the bottom for a long period of time. And then eventually it comes up with a number, which is always about this. I don't think the heart sensor is real. Sports is a bunch of sport related activities. We've got running, skipping and sit up. These are all the same. If I select it, it seems to be a timer. It may hook up to the step counter to make the KCAL thing work, assuming that's real. Let me just shake this about a bit. Has it done anything? No. So moving on. Message. Uh, this is possibly the only actual useful feature the thing has. This allows your smartphone to push messages to the watch and it displays them on the screen. I currently don't have it hooked up to a phone, so it just says null. And if I select it, nothing happens. Sleep appears to be some kind of sleep sensor. I don't know how this works and I don't care. Weather pulls weather information from an unknown source on the smartphone app. No smartphone, therefore it says it is sunny and zero degrees. Music lets you control your phone's music player somehow. It is deeply cumbersome. A single press cycles the cursor. A long press actually makes the thing happen. Of course, no smartphone, so it doesn't do anything. More takes you to more items. The first one of which is the camera. This does not have a camera. What this does is it triggers the camera on your phone. Again, no smartphone, doesn't do anything. Looking for causes the smartphone to vibrate and the phone has an equivalent feature that causes the wristband to vibrate. This could actually be useful. These things are so cheap that you could use one as a locator, you know, buy it, stick it on a keychain somewhere, except the battery life is not brilliant. I'll talk about that later. Theme lets you switch between the two watch faces. You've got the built-in one, programmable one. The smartphone app lets you program this to a limited extent. You can basically just change the backdrop. I've used a completely black one here and you can move the numbers around and that's all. Reset resets the thing. I'm not quite sure what this is supposed to achieve given that there is no state stored on this to speak of. This provides a QR code that takes you to the downloadable app, which is actually not completely trash, still quite trash. And this appears to be the about your smartwatch screen. Use the same chipset. And you've seen all the features. 
So what am I actually going to do with this thing? Well, the answer should be obvious. I'm going to pull it apart, which is done by spudging here. Uh, and then it just comes apart. And I was actually quite lucky there because bits are fragile. It does still seem to be working. So here is the thing. This metal pad here is for the touch thing. It pushes onto this metal mesh here on the front half. You've got the screen. We've got a little PCB underneath it. And this is as far as my disassembly has gone. So this is all new to me. We have a tiny battery, a that glued in? No, it's just sitting there. Uh, we've got the connection to the heart rate sensor, which is two wires. So yeah, I think that is probably just an LED. And that round thing is the vibration unit. Let me pull this out and put it down somewhere. Here we are looking at the bottom of the board. We have these two contacts here connect to the USB and they're used to charge the battery. The battery itself is soldered on here. These two contacts are for the LED slash heart sensor. The vibrator connects here. I have managed to break this wire. It was connected to that pad there. Here we have the microcontroller that makes it all tick. And there's some passives probably for managing the battery and doing the Bluetooth stuff. Let me turn it over. So this is what really interests me about this thing. On the board here, we have test pads. TX, RX, VBUS, and BT. That's probably the Bluetooth antenna. And if I move the screen out of the way, over on this side, we have Test 3.3 volts, ground, DAT, and SWS. And I happen to know that SWS is single wire debug. And oh good, it still works. So what we've got here is a battery powered microcontroller with a screen on a tiny PCB with Bluetooth low energy with a whole bunch of useful ports brought out. What can I do with this? Well, I think that is some of my finest work. That sucks.
sarcasm. This horrible mess of bad solder joints and captain tape is the fitness watch spread out onto a breakup board. It's actually one of these PCBs. This is a thing I had made for the Brother word processor project that I still haven't done the final episode on. I had to make five of these and I used one for the real project so I now have four spare. In fact they've got lots of connected pins and 3.3 volt and 5 volt power rails and so they're actually quite well suited for this and you know I might as well use it for something. Let me show you around the board. This is USB 5 volt power. It's routed through this switch here to the PCB. The battery, which is slightly squidgy, which is a bit disturbing, is routed through this switch also to the board. So I can isolate either the battery or all the power or just run it off AC, etc, etc. These two lights here indicate the status of the 5 volt and 3.3 volt rails. The 5 volt rail comes directly from the USB, 3.3 volt comes from the tap off the board's own regulator. That's this wire here. The peripherals are all still present, so we've got the vibrator here and the fake heart rate sensor here. And these pins are the UART TX and RX and reset SWS data and test and ground. And that is basically all there is to it. I used magnet wire in a lot of places. Is that magnet wire? No, that's, that's a hair. Uh, <laughs> this is magnet wire, which is very similar to a hair. Let me just get rid of that. I picked this because it was the thinnest wire I had, and in fact this turned out to be a big mistake. Magnet wire is incredibly hard to deal with, it's just so thin and flimsy that controlling it is difficult. Plus, before you can solder to it, you've got to strip the enamel coating off, which is a pain. Once I switched to this thicker wire, things became a lot easier. I can actually strip this using my fingernails. Having the microscope made an enormous difference. My ability to control the soldering iron accurately turns out to be limited by my ability to see rather than my ability to move the soldering iron itself. The trickiest bit of soldering was the reset wire, which actually goes on to one end of a tiny surface mount capacitor on the other side of this board. And that was really painful. And I'm very proud of the fact that I actually managed to solder one of these solid core wires to it. I think it's actually this green wire here, which goes to a pin here, which is then routed via track to the R pin there. This is the point where I finally come clean. I'm not reverse engineering this thing. Someone's already done that. I'm just following the instructions. And according to the instructions, now that I've done the breakout board, I should be able to build a debug interface, plug it in, and then I can read and write the flash. There's only one small problem. It doesn't flipping work. This is what the setup looks like. This is on rbaron.net's website, which has a lot of useful information on reverse engineering these things. The board here is very slightly different from mine, which is interesting and slightly suspicious. So it's possible that mine doesn't work the same way. But anyway, let me walk you through it. We're using the SDM32 blue pill as a debugger interface between the actual computer and the board itself. The board's debugger interface consists of a single line, SWS here, which is used for both transmit and receive. The blue pill debugger here is using two pins, a6 and A7. A7 is used for receive and A6 for transmit. There is also B0 here, which is used to hard reset the board and of course a ground interface. The protocol is weird and extremely bespoke. Each bit is transferred as five time units. These two red boxes here show a zero bit, which is low, high, 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 high and a one bit, which is low, 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 high. There is also, occasionally, 
a single low time unit which is used for handshaking. The conversation is controlled by the debugger interface. The board here only talks when the debugger tells it to. This avoids the need for any kind of contention logic. The debugger line is pulled high by a pull-up resistor. The two ends can drive it low by connecting the line to ground through a transistor. I don't know yet where the pull-up resistor is. It could be at either end. That is something I may need to find out. So why isn't it working on my setup? Well, as always, the thing to do is to hook it up to an oscilloscope and see what is actually going on. I have replaced my nice, neat test harness cable with this breadboard thing. The resistor and the test harness has been replaced with this pot. It's all set up and running. The PC is continually pinging the board with a get chip ID command. So all I need to do now is turn on the oscilloscope. And there's a thing. So that is a packet and its reply. If I zoom out, you can see that we're sending lots of packets one after the other. And if I zoom in, This stuff is the outgoing command to the board. This is the board's reply, which is very interesting. Notice that, if I can get this set correctly, the board's responses are not actually dropping to zero volts. They are only dropping by a pretty small amount. In fact, I should be able to tell this thing to figure out what it is. If I set it to here, uh, go to vertical, uh, V min, and down here it's 24 volts. That's not right. 35 volts. Um, I mean, it's clearly not 35 volts. I think I have the times 10 stuff set up incorrectly. So the probe is set to times 10, and it's set here to times 10, so it should be working, but ignore that. I mean, that's clearly 3.5 volts for the maximum and 2.4 volts for the minimum. If I scroll left, minimum goes down to minus 6.8, which is here. That mark there is showing zero volts. So that's interesting. It means that the board driver on the debug line is unable to drop the voltage all the way to zero. The most likely reason for this is that there's a pull-up resistor somewhere which the board's driver is unable to overcome. Looking at the circuit diagram, the reason why this resistor is in line between the debug line and the TX pin suggests that the pull-up resistor is on the TX pin of the microcontroller and that this thing is supposed to reduce the ability of the pull-up resistor to pull up, i.e. make it easier for this thing to pull the thing down. So possibly just increasing the resistance might help. But anyway, let's just try fiddling with this resistor. I haven't tried this. Let's see what happens to the that signal. So if we increase it. Nothing's happening. Yeah. In fact, I found two sets of instructions with different resistance values. This was set to 750 ohms. Uh, I also saw 1K ohm. Clearly, it doesn't matter what it is. So I think there's two possibilities as to why this isn't working. Two options. One is a software issue where that the Python client that's talking to the debugger interface doesn't understand this particular chip. That is, it's read the chip ID, but it doesn't understand it. The other option is that the debugger is unable to read the response from the board due to the pull-up resistor. 
And in fact, looking at the way this thing works, I'm a bit suspicious because the STM32 has controllable pull-up resistors and all the pins. So when this is listening to the board, shouldn't it be disabling the pull-up resistor, effectively tri-stating the pin? In fact, it should be possible for this thing to actually just use one pin, I think. There's probably something in the STM32 architecture that doesn't allow it, but that signal looks really suspicious to me. Finally, after a great deal of work, I have the debugger interface working. And all I had to do to make that happen was to throw away the STM32 version and write my own from scratch using an RP2040, AKA a Raspberry Pi Pico. In fact, the RP2040 PIO hardware makes this kind of interface really easy to use. So all I need now is a single connection from the SWS pin to the Pico and another connection for the reset line, and I don't need any of the resistor stuff or shorting two pins together or anything. But anyway, I can demonstrate that this is running, and now I can do this. Just to reset the board, and look, we have a flashing light. I have managed to compile one of our Baron's test programs, deploy it onto the thing, program the flash, and it works. And we have a flashing light. This is good news. It means we've done all the hardware stuff. The next step is to think about the software. Before we do that, we're going to go on a brief detour and take a look to see what's inside this thing. This is a zoomed in image that I stitched together from images from my terrible USB microscope. And it lets you see the major components of the inside. In particular, you can see the Bluetooth antenna, the clock crystal, the unpopulated pad for the heart rate sensor, clearly marked HRS, and a pad that I think might actually be for the accelerometer, in which case the step counter values I was looking at earlier would in fact be fake. But the most obvious component is the CPU, which is a TLSR8232. This is made by Telink, which is a Chinese Internet of Things company that produces chips for a bewildering different variety of protocols and applications. This particular chip, the TLSR8232, is strangely not visible on their product page. However, if we go to Mouser, you can find it for sale here. And this is exactly the same chip that's in my smartwatch. Entertainingly, even if you buy a thousand of them, the price you're paying is about half of what I paid for the entire smartwatch. Luckily, it is possible to find Telix documentation if you search for it with Google. And that gives you stuff like the data sheets, the SDK, the manual for the SDK, which is very useful. And of course, the IDE. The IDE is particularly important because it comes with a compiler toolchain. Why do you need a compiler toolchain? Well, this thing is not a ARM processor. It is Telling's proprietary CPU called the TC32. And the TC32 is fascinating. This is a file from Telling's SDK. This is the startup code. This is the first thing that executes when the chip comes alive. And it contains the usual stuff you'd expect to see here, like the very first thing in the flash is a jump to the reset routine. Here is where the IRQ is set up, etc., etc. Here is the reset routine itself at hex 20 bytes into the flash. And this is some TC32 machine code. And all the TC32 instructions, as you can see, start with a T. So T load R clearly, you know, loads a value from memory into a register. T comp compares two registers. Jump if greater than or equal to add. This is all looking extremely familiar if you're used to these small embedded risk machines. In fact, possibly too familiar. Let me show you their compiler. Luckily, there are Linux binaries available. Uh, TC32, ELF, GCC, and it is a GCC port. 
although there isn't any source available. If I ask it for target specific options, we get some stuff. Here is the option to enable TC32 code generation. Here is an option for modifying the arm thumb stack frame. Here are some stuff for the APCS arm calling convention stuff. In fact, as far as I can tell, I think their back end is basically the arm back end with a few minor adjustments. I suspect that all they've done is done a custom assembler and then changed the code generator to produce these instructions rather than the equivalent thumb instructions. So let's try an experiment. I will pull some code out of this file and convert it to thumb and then we'll assemble the two and see what they look like. So here it is. This is the TC32 code. This is the thumb code. And yes, I did just search and replace all the instruction names for the thumb equivalent. Here is the disassembly of the TC32 code. So here is that first T load R, which turns into 0910, etc., all the way down. Here is the disassembly of the thumb code. And you will see that the actual bytes generated are very nearly the same. In fact, as far as I can tell, there's only like one, maybe two bits of difference between the thumb instructions and the TC32 instructions, which means I'm pretty sure that TC32 is basically just a subset of thumb with the opcodes rearranged just enough that you can't run thumb code on a TC32 processor. This isn't necessarily a bad idea. The thumb instruction set is very good. It's spectacularly dense, producing very small programs. If you're going to base your own instruction set on something, you could do a lot worse than copy thumb. But this does seem to be kind of blatant. On the plus side, it does make the code quite easy to read. So let me delete all these windows and let's take a look at the SDK itself. It is not complicated, which is great. You get a directory full of headers and C files, which contains most of the interface to the underlying hardware. So if I go to gpio.c, this is the interface for the GPIOs. You get source. All these are doing is writing to the underlying hardware registers, which you can read up on in the datasheet. So we've got routines for initializing stuff, routines for changing the function and so on. The source being available means that it's easy to reason about and debug. There doesn't seem to be detailed SDK documentation, but there are lots of good comments, both in the implementation and in the headers that you'll likely be interacting with. You do get some binary only libraries. For example, this one contains the BLE stack. So you don't get source to that, which is a bit of a shame. You get a standard GNU LD linker script for actually putting together flash images, which is nice. It's all simple and straightforward and doesn't try to do anything that's magic, which is basically ideal if you're going to be writing software for one of these embedded chips. But most importantly, we also have our Baron's GitHub, who has done all the heavy lifting of figuring out how to actually build programs against the SDK. So I just follow here through to Blinky, and this is the program that I just ran. It's dead simple. We include a lot of the SDK stuff. We initialize the CPU. We tell it what clock crystal we're using, initialize the GPOs. Tell it that PB4 is to be used as a GPO, set it to be an output pin, set the level, and then every 500 milliseconds we toggle it. It's that simple. And there's also a make file that actually builds it. But honestly, this just being GCC and LD, that is pretty straightforward. So all in all, it's actually a simple and easy to use SDK, which I like. 
armed with our new knowledge of how things work, we can actually make some modifications to our program. Let's try making the UART work, because I haven't done that yet. It'll be interesting to try. So the first thing we need to do is that because of the pin assignments on the board, we need to move our blinky light pin away from B4 because that's going to be the UART TX line. We're going to use C1, which is the test pad, which I've already brought out to a pin. So that's just going to be a matter of pin PIO, PC1. That was PC1, wasn't it? Yes. And then change these to PIO, no, GPIO. PB4 to pin. Right. Now we want the UART. Our Baron has provided some handy sample code that makes the UART work, but it's using DMA and I don't want to use DMA for this. I want to do this the simple way. So we are going to go straight to the UART.h file, which contains all the SDK functions. And we want to, first thing we do is want to set the pins. So that will be UART set pin TXB4 RXB5 and PB4 GPIO PB5. Okay, now we want to initialize it using init board rate, which I looked at earlier. That is down here. We need to set the various clock dividers to get the board rate we want. We want 115 kiloboard. Luckily, the values are, we can just pull right off this table. So that's going to be 9,13. Now we want the parity and stop bit. So we want 8N1. So we go look at the enums up here. 8 you get by default. N is parity none. And stop bit one is here. Okay. In order to actually output something, we scroll down, we go past all the DMA and interrupt stuff, and eventually we get some standard functions marked NDMA for the non-DMA method, and this is the one we want. You are NDMA send byte. So you art NDMA send byte. And we're going to send our traditional lowercase q. Okay, that should be our program. So over here we rerun our make file and we get a output binary which we can look at and we see it is 4K of text, 12 bytes of initialized variables, 420 bytes of uninitialized. So that will be leaving, well, uh, 1684 minus 12 minus 420. That leaves that many bytes spare to do stuff with. Okay. So I think that's our program. The next thing to do is to download it onto the board, rearrange the pins, hook up a serial terminal, and see if it works. So back at the workbench, the first thing I'm gonna do is to just move the blinky over to the T pin. Then I can flash it using my Python client for the telling debugger thing that I put together. Let's do that from the right directory. There we go. There's a raise of flashes and writes it very slowly. That has successfully flashed it, but the CPU is still in halt. So tell it, tell it to run and oh, thank goodness that works. Okay, next thing is to hook up the UART. So this is the TX pin from the Picos UART, which I now see has the wrong connector. This has to connect to the pin over here. So let me just try and dig up a 
replacement wire. Got one. Okay, so. That goes to a spare row. I'm going to use white for this. That goes down here. And then this will then go to one of these two pins. Let's just go for that one first. Now back on the terminal, we want to start up our serial terminal. And nothing happens. Okay, the configuration is right, so I bet we've plugged that into the RX line. Let's try the other one. Oh, thank goodness. That this is actually the first time I've tried this for real. So I am very glad that that has worked with an absolute minimum of drama. So we've got a fully functioning SDK. We can write programs that are not the example programs that someone else wrote. We have the UART working. We have standard GPIOs working. We don't have the screen working yet, but honestly, I trust our Baron's code to do that. So the next thing is to write something with it. Oh, look, I seem to have done a MicroPython port. So if anyone doesn't know what MicroPython is, it's a port of Python to ridiculously small microcontrollers. It runs just fine in this thing, 16K of RAM, and it gives you a full Python environment. You know, this we are looking at here the Python command line. So you can do expressions, you can do strings, you can define functions, you can do classes, it all works. Porting it is really straightforward. It took me about an hour to get from a C hello world to getting the MicroPython command prompt working. There were a lot of later rough edges as I learned more about how both MicroPython and this thing works. It turns out that the SDK that I said was pretty good is less good once you look at the details. It's got a lot of missing features, undocumented things, and just plain broken things. But I have made it work. So not only do we have a full Python system, we have a bunch of peripherals as well. So I can do uh, imp from machine import pin. I can make a pin. I can type on this little keyboard. Uh, let me see, we put our white LED on test, I think it was, that's called pad test. It's an output pin. We can set it high. The light goes on. We can set it low. Light goes off. I did also, by the way, find that uh, the green LED here is in fact hooked up to the debugging port. So we can repurpose that as a GPIO. Uh, that should be called pad. Oh yes, notice that you actually get a proper read line implementation. It even has tab completion. I'm not sure you can see that, there it is. Um, and we can set it off and on again. Let's turn it off because it's probably taking quite a lot of current. We have other features. Oh yeah, before I do that, let me just show you if we import GC, this allows us to show you how much memory is free, which is 7K. Let me do a garbage collection. And that's gone up to 9.5K. That's actually a reasonable amount for this thing. You can write respectable small programs and they will fit in RAM. But of course, this being MicroPython, there are features here. You don't have to put your Python programs in RAM. You can embed them into the Flash image and run them directly out of Flash. So your Python bytecode consumes no RAM. So the RAM here is used only for your program workspace and it stretches a lot further than you would think. But other features, let me import OS. We have a file system, which is empty. So MicroPython is currently about 130 odd K. 
and the flash is 512k of which 500 is usable so all the rest is a little fs flash file system and if i can find this one stat vfs uh, stat vfs slash that shows us we're using 4k blocks there are 85 on the flash 81 are in use let's write a file let's write mode and we're going to write hello world uh, where did i put the backslash on this keyboard not that one Oh yeah, it's an American keyboard. It doesn't have a backslash when there's a UK key map on it. And let's just do that then. And it writes and closes the file. So now if we do this here again, there is our file. And if we do stat VFS, we can see we've used one block. The command line prompt makes writing programs for this thing a breeze. But there are other features. Let me switch. Actually, let me close the terminal and switch to the other thing here because Adafruit's Ampi program is a very handy tool that will talk to a MicroPython or CircuitPython board and do stuff with it. So if we do ls, it will show us the file system and I can do get test.txt and that has read and dumped test.txt as stood out uh, let me try and put a file let's do put readme.md and that should copy it onto the flash like so. Go back to here, fire up the terminal again. OS.list dear. Ah, uh, Ampi does a soft reset of the board. So we have to do that. And there's our file. We can do uh, A equals, actually let's do for L in trying to remember how this works uh, open test dot text does that work print l yep that does work uh, i should probably use a uh, a with there but i'm not going to these are just going to leak and stay open the garbage collector will catch them eventually Yes, it's not a very big file. So I've zoomed in a bit on the thing to make it a bit more visible. You won't be able to see me typing, but never mind. Let me write a very simple program just to show you how this works. We want to we want to not do that. From machine import pin. So we are going to create a pin for the uh, the LED, which is on uh, pad SWS, uh, pin dot out, it comes up on, let me turn that off. Uh, the sense is inverted, so let me turn that off. Button is button pin dot in, uh, while, while true. LED not button. So now if I push the button, this is the thing that MicroPython makes so easy. I don't have to flash it. I don't have to compile anything. You can just connect up your serial terminal and type and it just works. Let me reset the thing. Hey, that worked. So the LEDs attached to the 
software debugging pin. I had repurposed that as a GPIO, and yet I was still able to reset the board using the debugger. So apparently just because it's a GPIO doesn't mean the debugger stops listening, which is a little bit worrying, to be honest. What happens if you're using it as an I.O. pin and you just happen to receive stuff that the debugger interprets anyway? Never mind. So let me go back to this window and I'll show you another feature, which is this one. We can use Ampy to download and run arbitrary Python files, which is great for doing development. And in fact, what I've done is... Oh, yeah. Uh, have to turn off the serial terminal first, otherwise that may get everything confused. Back to the other window. There we go. We have a clock. Yes, I made the screen work. That was really annoying. So the screen is interesting. Our Baron's watch has a ST7789, I think, possibly a something three, but one of those. This does not. This has a GC1209, which is subtly incompatible to the ST7789, which means that these watches do vary somewhat, which is not great. So I knew that our Barons had a slightly different PCB from having looked at pictures, but having a different screen is interesting. So the big difference between this and the ST7789 is the ST7789 has more video memory. It will support 320 by 240 screens. And the controller chip, which is embedded into this glass slab, contains the frame buffer for the screen. You send commands to it that draw into the video memory and then stuff shows up on the screen. The GC1209 has less video memory, so it only supports a frame buffer of 132 by 132 or something by 160. I forget what the something is. This screen is 80 by 160, so we need the second mode. You control which geometry the controller chip is set to by strapping certain pins. And this interface cable has the wrong set of pins strapped. So when the thing starts up, it assumes it's connected to a 132 by 132 LCD and you only get part of the screen. It's cropped to form a 132 by 132 square. You can override the geometry setting but it took forever to find the weird undocumented command sequence from someone on the interwebs that does it. Luckily, I did find it. At that point, I was basically reduced to randomly fiddling with things to try and understand what was going on. So it was a great relief when I finally made it work. Anyway, this is a clock. It's a very bad clock. It shows the time since startup since the clock program started up, rather, the internal timer is 32 bits and rolls over rather irritatingly soon. So I have to keep my own count off the time, which gets updated once a second. We have, just to show it's doing something, in tiny blue writing down here is the amount of free memory. And if you watch it, you can see it slowly count down as the heap fills up and then jump up again as a garbage collection happens. And over here, we have what might be the battery voltage. This is using some of Telink sample code to try and read the battery, but their code was producing nonsensical results. And I ended up scaling it by a factor of two and it produces what might be the right results. I fiddled with it a bit and it does vary slightly and it does seem to drop when I disconnect the power but I don't know if it's working. Which brings me to my next major point. I don't have any power management stuff in this, so it's running flat out. How long will this tiny and disturbingly squishy battery last? So I am going to rig up a time lapse and find out. I was 
was honestly expecting it to take longer than that. I know what's happening, of course. This is my clock program in Python. The way it works is it figures out when the next second is and it just sleeps for that long. This isn't actually quite right due to the way the clock rolls over. Really, I need to figure out a way to change the underlying clock time to be a 64-bit int. But anyway, this works well enough. But if we go look at the sleep function, this is my implementation in the TC32 backend. And all it does is it calls the telling SDK sleep function. And if we go and look at that, it just spins the CPU at full power for the appropriate amount of time. The CPU is running flat out at 100% maximum power usage. So that is why we're only getting about 45 minutes of runtime. Really what I should be doing is using an interrupt, setting one of the hardware timers, and then putting the CPU to sleep until the interrupt happens. But I don't know how to do that. There are some functions in the SDK that suggest that they're doing that, but they don't seem to be complete. And at this point, I can't be bothered to actually, you know, figure it out. I can deal with all of that later because I have other things to get on with. You see, I have a new smartwatch. Yes, by buying another one, I now magically have two of them. This is the original packaging. You get a plastic bag full of smartwatch stuff. We have the watch, which works. And we have a silicone wristband, which kind of works. And we have some instruction manuals, which I haven't bothered to read, but probably also indeed works. The point of this is that the one that I vivisected, which is here in this plastic bag, is probably not going back inside the case. So by buying a second one, it's not like they're expensive, I should be able to do a similar modification to this, but in a much more user-friendly way, and hopefully end up with something that is actually, you know, small and elegant and useful and stuff. But first, of course, Okay, let's open this up the way I did the other one. Like so. Yeah, I sincerely doubt that this thing is waterproof. So here we have the works just as they were before. Uh, it looks like the same PCB. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the same. And I want to try and add some pins somewhere for an external connector. I thought of using this. If I can cut away part of the case, I should then be able to solder some thin wires in. dremeling later and I do actually have a slot for this thing it would stick in here I'll probably I need to fasten it in with hot glue but now it's done I don't really like it very much yeah I'm not very keen luckily I do have two of these cases there's the other one so there is a certain amount of scope for screwing up. Yes, I think I prefer it with the wires and the hole. 
It's less elegant in that there's wee stuff hanging off it when it's not in use, but I think it's going to be so much less hassle this way. So can we fit the works back in? There we go. That's the PCB in place. Now let's see if we can actually route these wires somewhere useful. this I'm trying to route the wires through this tiny little hole but I am doing it all wrong I don't need a hole by cutting a slot rather than a hole I achieve exactly the same effect because when the lid is put on it turns into a hole but now I can just slide the wires down rather than having to thread them through the hole. So here it is, all hooked up. And if I touch the button, it still works, which is rather nice. I have this here hooked up to my debugger bridge on the Raspberry Pi Pico via four wires in order, TX or possibly RX, RX or possibly TX, ground and SWS data. I do not have the reset line hooked up because Getting at the reset line of one of these things is ridiculously hard, and it turns out you don't actually need it. When the stock firmware is running, the debugger cannot communicate with the device. However, I can manually restart this, and then the debugger can grab control and halt the CPU. This has actually shown up an interesting point, which is once the CPU is halted, you can't turn it off. The battery is hardwired into it. I can unplug the USB, but I can't unplug the battery. This means that it will just sit there with the CPU halted, running the battery down until the battery goes flat. The only way of getting out of this state is to use the debugger to start the CPU up again. So let's plug this back in. Turns out this is not plugged in at this end. There we go and it starts charging. So I have the debugger working and I have been able to dump the ROM, which has shown up a rather interesting issue in that the ROM on this is actually different from the one I got off the vivisected one. Here we are looking at the two ROMs. The one on the left is from the old wristband and the one on the right is from the new wristband. And they are very similar, but there is a byte here which is different and in addition, there are more changes further on. Each of these things has a version number, which if I find, oops, typing correctly, come on, there we go. V17944 for the old one, and V17387 for the new one. And you can see this in the about page. More than that, there's a additional serial number, which you can see here, 309141545, also visible on the About screen. While over on this one, the number is different. And you'll also notice that these strings are in a different place. I did dump the ROM several times and compared the results, so I'm pretty sure that they are correct. Also, I have reflashed the old wristband with the old ROM and it works, so that's nice. I haven't tried that yet on the new one. I was expecting the ROMs to be different because the shoddy app that comes with them, Fit Pro, 
when you change a preference setting, it actually reflashes the device remotely. So I was expecting to see some changes, but I would have thought that that would just be the, the visual assets, this, this stuff. But it seems to be more than that. Given that the screens are different in the two devices, then maybe there is a different driver built in. Or maybe it just happens to update this stuff when you change the preferences and what I'm looking at is nothing at all. I will try reflashing the second device with the old ROM and seeing what happens. But I honestly have other things I want to do with it, such as run MicroPython on it. Yep, it works fine. I find more. Go through to this page. V17944. This is the version number for the first ROM. Anyway, on to MicroPython. Okay, because the reset line's not hooked up, it's asking me to manually reset the thing. Oh yeah, I have to unplug the power to get the watch to actually start up normally. So I find more. Reset. And here we go. And it works. Excellent. Uh, I'm, this means I do, in fact, have the RX and the TX lines wired the right way around, which means I can replace this horrible thing with an actual connector. Okay. Dot pi, here we go. That's the wrong port. Switch that to TTY2. Uh, and the watch works. Excellent. Although I notice, I think the colors are different and it's clipped. So I've gone away and looked at the footage and yes, the colors are different. I will bring up some B-roll here. Now, this is very interesting. It suggests that there is a way for the firmware to figure out what kind of screen is being used and configuring it accordingly, because the configuration settings are obviously different for the different types of screen. I was unable to make this work. I tried it. I wanted to read back stuff like the screen ID, and I would actually thought that the MISO line, master in, slave out, which connects the screen to the processor, wasn't hooked up. But this means that if the firmware is capable of adapting to different screens, there must be a way for it to do that. So have another look, I suppose. But anyway, the main thing is it works. So sum up time. I think these things are really interesting. They're cheap. They're easy to hack. They're pleasantly unusual. I mean, not just another arm. And if you hunt for it, there's a reasonable amount of information out there. There's a decent data sheet with holes in it. There's a mostly adequate SDK with holes in it. There's a compiler with big holes in it. I'll get onto that later. And you can get these absolutely everywhere. So here is AliExpress, pages of them. And then for some reason you go on to performance sports stripes for BMW. And the pricing on AliExpress is, you know, anything from two and a bit euros to seven, eight euros. If you go to Alibaba, they're even cheaper, but of course you do need to buy more. I found this one where the price actually starts at 80 US cents. Although for that, you do have to buy 100 million of them. For your three francs, dollars, pounds, euros, you actually get quite a bit of functionality. They run MicroPython very nicely. There's actually quite a lot of hardware in one of these things. Now, the biggest thing 
about these devices, which I haven't really talked about, is the Bluetooth low energy stack. The reason why I haven't talked about it much is that even though there are samples in the SDK for making it work, and R. Baron has some examples, for some reason, the BLE stack wants to load into RAM, not into flash, and it consumes 10K. And given that the device has 16K and it uses 2.5K for its SPI cache, that doesn't really leave a lot of space. So if it's going to be at all viable to use BLE with MicroPython, it will need a brand new stack that uses less RAM. The other big issue is you do have to modify them in order to reprogram them. You can flash them OTA, and I suppose it would be possible to reverse engineer that protocol, but I don't want to. So anyone who wants to flash it is going to have to open it up and solder some very small wires on. One issue I came up with that hasn't showed up on camera is that Without the reset line wired up, I actually had a fair bit of difficulty making the device reboot properly after flashing an image. I think it was failing to reset properly. Now, it is possible to halt and run the CPU via the debug interface. And I'm not sure that restarting the CPU is working properly. I have also found a command which is supposed to do a full reset of the device, but I'm not convinced that works properly either. It's much easier if you can wire up the reset line, but wiring up the reset line is decidedly non-trivial. And now let's talk about the compiler. Tellink has a port of GCC to the TC32. It is very old and not very good, and there's no source available, which is really naughty of them. It's got some really bad bugs. For example, here is a C program. It is just a simple switch statement which compiles into a jump table. Down here are the targets. So here is where we call func with parameter zero. We load the parameter, we jump to tjl func to actually do the work. Here we have the jump table, and this is encoded as a set of bytes. Unfortunately, here is the code that actually jumps via the jump table. And we take the initial value, we multiply it by four, we load the address of the jump table, we add the jump table address to the multiply by four value, read the address, and jump, but these are not addresses, these are bytes. This just doesn't work, it's garbage. Luckily, there's a compiler flag that allows you to make the compiler generate tree-style switch statements. Here it is, and those do work, but without the flag, your code will just crash as soon as it hits a switch statement. So for this to be a decent platform, it really needs a new compiler. Porting, you know, LLVM or GCC to the TC32 would be hard. However, I suspect it would be much easier to generate Cortex-M0 code and then assemble this for the TC32 because I think that the two architectures are so similar that this would be trivial. So there is some interesting work there to figure out the exact relationship between TC32 and Cortex-M0. Given the battery life, I'm not sure one of these would actually work as a watch. It would be interesting to see how long the battery would last when sleeping. Probably easily long enough, but I don't know whether you could sleep the CPU while also having the LCD enabled and still get 24 hours battery life. The stock firmware just turns the screen off after a few seconds. You have to touch the button to make the time appear, which means it's not very useful as a watch but I can totally imagine these things being useful as a mini control panel user interface for some other project. Just being able to use one as a monitor, so all it does is display data that's fed to it via the UART or something, that would be plausible. A little fiddly to modify the device to actually do that, but it's not like they're expensive. So anyway, I am gonna leave it here 
because this has actually taken quite a while of wall clock time and I am desperately afraid that this is going to end up either being a two hour video or a 10 minute video. So I need to go away and start editing. There is a lot more stuff to do here. I may or may not do some of it off camera, depending on how enthusiastic I feel. Everything is going up on GitHub, including my debugger bridge, which is this thing currently being displayed here. as a standard Raspberry Pi Pico project. The MicroPython port, I'm gonna to talk to the MicroPython people about upstreaming it. I am not sure they will want it given that it needs this weird proprietary compiler, but we'll see. But that will be on GitHub anyway. Stuff like ROMs and the SDKs and the data sheets I have uploaded to archive.org. Links to all these things will be below in the description. So, as always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.